Okay, well, Dr. Eric Davis from Earth Tech, right? And that's uh, no. used to for ground studies at Austin. Oh, okay, okay. Which is, is you know, you, you could say both or one. <laughs> well, can you tell me a little bit about what you're presenting about this year? Or? Well, uh, actually, I'm presenting three papers, and two papers as a first author and one paper as a co-author. Uh, the first of my two papers is first author. One of them is I'm reviewing um, experimental concepts for studying ways to extract energy from the quantum vacuum. And it's basically a summary of some experimental concepts uh, that we've been exploring and we're going to be doing in the laboratory to see if we can extract energy from the zero point fluctuations. Uh, we'll also put a little background history on the zero point fluctuations, what it is physically, its numerical magnitudes and consequences if we can uh, extract such energy for applications in commercial space flight, uh, commercial power systems and so forth. Um, the other paper I'm authoring is on uh, a review of laboratory concepts for extracting negative energy, for generating negative energy in the laboratory that would be used for generating FTL space times. And uh, like traversal wormholes or Alcubierre warp drive or Krasnikov tube warp drives or whatever, the idea is to look at uh, the definition of negative energy so that people who are not specialists in general relativity can understand what it really means. The term is misapplied and misused so much that uh, everybody gets confused and don't know what they're talking about usually. So I'm going to clear that up by describing uh, what negative energy is, give its physical definition, uh, and then examine the background of the kinds of uh, effects in quantum theory where negative energy can be is known to be generated. And then uh, I'm going to look at some uh, selected concepts that have been developed that could hopefully uh, produce negative energy in the laboratory by the oh, way of okay. advanced quantum optics techniques. The other paper is a, a paper joint with uh, Harold White from NASA Johnson Space Center. He's doing this as a private citizen and not as a NASA employee uh, as part of his graduate uh, thesis work for his PhD in general relativity. Uh, it's on examining Alcubierre's warp drive in higher dimensional space times using deep brain theory. And we show that in deep brain theory, you can actually eliminate the negative energy requirement and replace it with the positive energy and a negative pressure. Well, this is a really a, a real breakthrough paper, right? Because this is the, at least in, from what I've seen, this is the first time we've ever seen an applied physics approach to string of brain theory. Right. So that, that, I mean, that's a real hallmark achievement. Right. And the idea is we believe that the Alcubierre metric or any kind of warp metric really represents a velocity boost that goes off the brain that we live on into the higher dimensional space and the equation of state of matter or energy that you need to affect that physical thing <coughs> would give you requirement for positive energy and negative pressure so not any negative exotic matter at all is required. The equation of state looks like the dark energy equation of state in, in the universe and so uh, so, uh, Harold had proposed a, a a first order or rough sketch lab experiment that we could do uh, using lasers in order to try to see if we can test this theory. Oh, okay. And okay. so there you go. Well, so do you think there's more of a future out there then for brain theory? Because you know, a lot of people have questioned it in terms of, well, string theory mostly, but so can we use this? Here you guys are using this, so does that... Yeah, the, the door isn't closed on brain theory yet because it hasn't been disproved. Uh, Whenever you do experiments, you try to falsify a theory in order to prove it. That's the way you prove theory, you try to falsify it. If you can't falsify it, you've proved it, literally. Um, this is just one way of being able to test some aspect of D-brain theory that we think could work in a lab to create an FTL space-time effect, like the Alcubierre warp drive. So this would be almost literally the Star Trek warp drive, then? Yeah, in a way, but this will be low level. It isn't going to be dramatic. It's not going to, you're not going to expect to see anything disappearing in the laboratory and zipping off we to the nearest star. Else, It'll yeah. be a low level, low energy uh, uh, experiment that will give us an idea of what direction we're taking, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, what we could do better. Uh, it'll be an exploration of this thing to see how right it is. If it doesn't work, it doesn't mean it's not right. It just means we don't have the right experimental concept. Uh, we would have to go back to the drawing board and try to reanalyze everything and see what experimental devices what configuration of energies, lasers, fields, what whatnot, would be more appropriate to make this happen? Uh, you know, if this configuration that uh, Harold is proposing uh, doesn't work, then we need to find other configurations that will make it work. Oh, okay. And if it doesn't work at all, then it might call into question whether deep brain theory even works or not. Well, now on your badge, I should focus in on your badge, I guess. It also says that, that you're a chairman, right? You're a speaker and a chairman. So, so in terms of Section F, can you tell me a little bit about the papers that you're you're reviewing then? Or I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. You you reviewed some of the papers as well, right? You're right. 
for, for other people. Can you tell me a little bit about those? Or? Uh, uh, no, no. The idea is I just did a peer review on the papers to see that they reached a level of uh, uh, publication quality required by state and uh, scientific quality required by poor scientific standards to publish papers. And uh, there were papers that got rejected because they were poorly written and not because the ideas were bad. Uh, the authors just don't know how to write a paper. And oh, sure. We couldn't get them sure. to come around. Then there were papers that were rejected probably for almost a combination of both reasons. Usually the ideas are really bad, not provable based on hearsay, uh, not on the scientific method. Yeah. And no logical, coherent flow of information could uh, could make you believe that it even the idea works or whatnot. So papers did get rejected, but it wasn't a lot of papers. Really, uh, a minority of papers got rejected, and the vast majority got accepted. And there is also a limit to how many we can handle because we're only allowed four papers per session, and we were given eight sessions. We have the largest number of sessions in this conference this year. Yeah. So uh, I know that some papers that did get rejected only because the paper writing quality was bad. They're going to be loud oral presentations, so they're going to be here providing uh, an oral talk on their on their paper. Oh, but, but didn't the difference would be it doesn't go to the AAP Yeah, program. it won't be in the proceedings, but they have it in the abstract booklet, and they will make an appearance at the FO8 session Thursday oh, morning, okay. I think. And so those are the papers that only got rejected because for one reason or the other, the author was not able to spend the time to bring it into the right format. Oh, sure. And and then may, there might even be some one paper that has questionable information on it. We allowed it in um, well, for the benefit that there's anomalous information in there that might benefit you know future direction. There was there was another one also that was kind of the economics of high frequency gravity waves. And now in terms of state, I guess it makes sense. It wasn't very scientific. It was more of a business case. But it would be interesting. You know, there, there are rumors. I guess Paul Muir is talking about putting together a high frequency gravity wave conference for. Mm -hmm maybe mid-summer or 2007 sometime, so I wonder if those might, might qualify some of the things that didn't quite fit with STAFE. Uh, no, they, those kind of things do fit with STAFE because STAFE is about propulsion and power, and anything that can affect advances and increases in propulsion and power for space and space commercial applications is, is acceptable. Uh, if you're looking at high frequency gravity waves, you might find ways of improving space communications. You might find ways of modifying gravity locally to enhance your space propulsion. You can use high frequency gravity waves for weapons applications. You can use high frequency gravity, gravity waves for a number of applications. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, astronomy, basically. Cosmology and astrophysical astronomy. Uh, you can use high frequency gravity waves for a number of things. And uh, the economics of it was is a paper I think that was presented last year. I don't know if there's one like that this year. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that pertains to if you have a high frequency gravity wave based technology in the way of a communication system that's uh, superior to all the relay satellites we have now. It's a direct line of sight through the earth communication system. Uh, what's the economic benefit of that over a traditional system? Oh, how, yeah. how much more difficult or expensive will it be to field it, uh, to develop it, and so forth? You presume the technology, uh, the physics is right, the technology is there. It's just that you want to look at how advantageous is it to use that as, a, as opposed to standard high-frequency microwaves or even uh, direct line-of-sight laser beam communication. Well, given all these applications, do you have any thoughts for funders who might be, might be watching down the road when we get this on the web? In, in terms of what they might consider putting their money into and, and if they should wait perhaps for years or if this is a good time to invest and then some directions that they might go in terms of investing. Well, I think the funders should look at the state proceedings in the F sessions, particularly since we represent the New Frontiers and Future Concepts. If you're looking at New Frontiers and Future Concepts as something you want to put your money into, then look at the paper proceedings, read every one of them carefully and decide which topic that was published there that you like the most, that you would like to see developed. And uh, you might also want to look at the previous two symposiums. See, this year is the third symposium of New Frontiers and Future Concepts. We also had the previous second and first uh, symposiums, which was uh, last year was the second and the year before was the first one. Uh, you want to look at the proceedings from there too in the F sessions and those symposiums and see and decide for yourself whether something there is what you like to do. I think high frequency gravity wave, gravity modification, um, uh, faster than light space times like wormholes and warp drives, those are all valid concepts you should put you could put money into. Also power concepts like extracting energy from the vacuum or exotic, uh, no one has ever thought about type ideas involving electromagnetics, which we haven't yeah. thought of before. Well, in, in, terms of, in terms of the lab, now you mentioned an upcoming experiment. I know Earth Tech in the past, or Institute for Advanced Studies, 
has done all sorts of neat stuff. Farnsworth Fuser. There's a great Farnsworth Fuser online that apparently Hal and Michael Agassin have built that's on the website. But, but um, one of the things that I, I'm kind of wondering about is the timeline for these experiments to begin. I mean, in, in terms of transporting you know, even a small particle of matter, you know, through some kind of a wormhole device. Do you think that we, we have that on the horizon in the near future, or do you think that's several years away still? Oh, are you talking about actually implementing it, or just yeah, well, even, even negative a test, effects of it? Yeah, even in a test case, just, just kind of validating. Oh, uh, we, don't know, we don't know yet. I mean, essentially, standard traversable wormhole theory has no event horizons. There's no such thing. And if it's a stationary wormhole, it's, it's not a time machine. So those, those those things are not considerations in this case. Oh, okay. 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 There's there's very specific specific difficult ways of turning a wormhole into a time machine, and worrying about horizons and going backwards and so forth and so on. Those those require extreme movement of the wormhole, one end of the wormhole as compared to the other end, in order to to affect time dilation and things like that. Um, no, but standard stationary wormhole, it's just going to open up and connect two different regions and across space together, and that's it. You go in, you come out. Now, the, do, you, do you think... It's nothing any more difficult than what, uh, what's what been described by Morrison Thorne or Matt Visser in his monograph. Yeah, but it's be very difficult. stable, very sane, uh, very uh, unexciting <laughs> type of a wormhole. But difficult to produce, do you think? I mean, in a lab environment, you know, given... You know, even, even for a small wormhole size, do you think it's possible to transport matter like in the next few years, given current technology? I don't know. I, oh, not with, no, not given current technology. We're not oh, there okay. yet. We don't have the magnitudes of the negative energy uh, in order to generate a wormhole that would be realizable. I think all we're going to do is look at micro-wormhole development in the lab. We, do, we can maybe corral just enough negative energy over just a small enough period of time that we could see some kind of a measurable effect. That's, it's only baby steps right now, and oh. well, uh, the even, technology is not... First of all, we don't have the technology to to generate enough negative energy. We don't have a way of measuring it in the lab yet. We don't have a way of concentrating it in a place where you can then start shaping it into a wormhole. Uh, we don't have that one yet. We're just getting started now with concepts of generating negative energy, yeah. thinking about it, implementing the first steps in the laboratory, and then uh, evolving that technology forward to where we can then start worrying about the rest of it. Uh, well, but, but once it does start to reach... So, I mean, as far as... I was going to answer your question. Oh, I'm say, sorry. As far as in the future, it's going to be... It could be 30 years or more. Oh, I, okay. I don't know. You know, that's just a pessimistic view. Uh, technology accelerates and advances in sudden abrupt changes every, every here, and, here and there. So you never can predict when things uh, increase in time or decrease in time. Oh, yeah. Um, so I just say, you know, 30 years from now might be... We might be possibly looking at being able to send create a little small wormhole in the lab and send a beam of particles through it, but that's the best I think we can do. And oh, okay. Given, you know, the unlikely event that, uh, or the low probability event that some breakthrough happens that we can make even more negative energy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks again for your time, Eric. Okay. Dr. Eric Davis from Institute of Advanced Studies.